Hello, my friends. Good evening. Uh, today, uh, the topic is the music of the spheres and harmonic astrology and ancient tradition. So I'm going to be talking about how harmonic astrology, which is a new kind of astrology developed in modern times, has its foundation in this ancient idea of music of the spheres. Okay, so I'm going to make four key points here. Number one, in ancient times, ancient Western astrology, there were five aspects. Aspects are angular distances between planets considered to be important. And then, around the year 1600, uh, Johannes Kepler introduced additional aspects, which we now often refer to as minor aspects, because it's generally believed by many astrologers that these aspects are not as important as the five original ones, we could call them. Um, and the third point is that some astrologers claim that Kepler's modern ideas are nonsense, and his ideas derail astrology from its ancient heritage. So there's this idea that, you know, Kepler came in, introduced all this new stuff, and John Addy, another astrologer in the 1970s, really developed these ideas, and they've derailed astrology from its original, pure, pristine, and more perfect uh, form. So... Uh, and the fourth point is that Kepler's idea of what we now call minor aspects is, however, based on ideas that have an ancient astrological heritage. Um, these ancient ideas uh, are the ideas of harmonics and the music of the spheres. So this view that Kepler all of a sudden came in and introduced these new ideas and upset everything, uh, well, he might have upset some things, um, but I want to talk about the ancient heritage behind these ideas. Um, so here are the five aspects that were used um, and still are used, the conjunction, opposition, square, trine, and sextile. Uh, you're all probably familiar with those. And um, you may also know that in some astrological tradi traditions, the aspects were not always necessarily 90 degrees, give or take some orb, just planets that are in signs that square each other were considered to be squares. So Taurus squares Leo and uh, Taurus squares Aquarius. So those signs are squared. Um, so any planets in those signs would be square to each other. So the, it's the basic idea that somewhere around 90 degrees would be a square. Now, is it true that Kepler introduced these additional aspects? It is true, and I want to just confirm that. This is from a little booklet that Kepler wrote called "Concerning the More Fundamentals of Concerning the More Certain Fundamentals of Astrology," published in 1602. So he wrote this little booklet on you know the stuff he thinks really works, uh, the more certain fundamentals of astrology. Uh, so I'll quote this uh, from this little booklet that he wrote. Quote, to be sure, the ancients did not admit more than five aspects, as they are generally called, the conjunction, opposition, square, trine, sextile. Yet my mind told me first to add three, quintile, biquintile, semi-quartile, which have subsequently been confirmed by manifold experience. Okay, so he says it, my mind told me. Um, I don't know if that's just awkward from the translation or what, but... Uh, so he thought it up. He says, I thought it up. I came up with these ideas for additional aspects. He actually introduced a lot more. He's talking in the context of weather predicting. Um, so he introduces these new, new aspects. Uh, that doesn't mean somebody else didn't also think of it, but, but Kepler did think of it independently. He, that's what he tells us. So that's true. He introduces these aspects. Um, and here's an example of Kepler using these new aspects. He calls them the new aspects as opposed to the old or standard aspects. So uh, in another part of this little booklet he says, quote, I expect a normal April, warm at the beginning on account of the biquintile of Mars and the Sun. Beautiful, mild, moist weather follows, for besides the old aspects, among the new is found the quintile of Saturn and Mars. So you have this idea... Um, that he's introducing these new aspects, the quintile, which is 72 degrees, the biquintile, which is 144 degrees, and he's using them, and he says, hey, man, they work. Um, by his manifold experience, you know, they, these, these seem to work. Okay, so, um, now, 
Um, now here's the reaction to Kepler's ideas. This is from Robert Zoller in his book, The Arabic Parts in Astrology, A Lost Key to Prediction, published in 1980. This is a very important book. It was one of the leading books um, in this revival of Hellenistic astrology in the 1980s. So this came out relatively early in, in this revival, which is continuing today, uh, starting in the 1980s. So this was one of the first ones where astrologers started digging into the ancient tradition to find out what was astrology in the Middle Ages or even further back. Um, and people have gotten excited about this because until the 1980s, most of us, most of us in astrology didn't, didn't know much about the ancient systems. So here's um, Zoller's reaction to Kepler's contribution to astrology. Um, <clears throat> so I'm quoting from page 12 of his book. Although employed as an astrologer by King Rudolf II of Hungary, Kepler was out of touch with any true living tradition of astrology. Whew, that's a pretty strong statement. He's, this guy is out of touch. He is not with it. Okay, sorry, interjected something there. I'll continue with the, uh, with the quote. Yet many of the modern innovations that are widely embraced today rest upon Kepler's distorted astrology. The emphasis on a mechanistic, materialistic universe has harmed astrology certainly as much as it has the other arts and sciences in the insistent quest for a material cause Behind every phenomenon, all astrological doctrines, including the parts, he's referring to the Arabic parts, that are not immediately understandable in terms of physical astronomy, come under question. Okay, well those are pretty potent words there. You know, he's, he's saying that Kepler is uh, out of touch, uh, the, their modern innovations, this, they, they emphasize this mechanistic and materialistic universe, um, so uh, they're not understandable in terms of physical astronomy. They come under question. So pretty strong words there from Robert Zoller uh, against uh, Kepler's uh, contributions to astrology. Um, however, we need to correct some impressions that Zoller is giving of history because he's actually distorting how, what the history was when he, when he lumps together Kepler and his, quote, emphasis on a mechanistic, materialistic universe. So we just want to set the record straight here, because Kepler was not working primarily in the extreme empirical mode, which later in philosophy developed into the extreme of what's called positivism. Um, that, that actually came later uh, as, as a strong movement. Kepler was working in the Pythagorean and Platonic tradition, uh, in, in this tradition, you're looking for these pure forms and numbers that are behind the material world and the manifest reality. And, uh, of course, Kepler discovered the pure geometric form of the ellipse as a basis for planetary orbit. So he was looking for this um, number and geometry behind, <clears throat> excuse me, behind the way things appear. He did, in fact, discover it. Uh, he was in search of a music of the spheres and a model of the universe based on number and harmony. So you can call this mechanistic and materialistic if you want to. Um, but in Kepler's mind, he was searching for the mind of God, the intelligence that framed the physical universe according to perfect form and number. So the attitude about what Kepler is doing is very different from Kepler's point of view, as, as he states it in, in his writings. Um, then to come later and say, well, you know, he's mechanistic, he's materialistic. Well, he's he's he is looking for number and harmony b behind the physical world. Um, but in astrology, we're always measuring things out there. So the frame of reference is a little bit different. Um, in that Kepler is is religiously and spiritually motivated, as are many of the people in the Pythagorean and Platonic traditions. Um, so, you know, here's a quote, just to, to verify or support what I'm saying. You, you can Google, you know, um, you know, music of the spheres. It might take, you can go to Wikipedia, for example. And here's a quote from Wikipedia. Pythagoras proposed that the sun, moon, and planets all emit their own unique hum, 
or an orbital resonance based on their orbital revolution. And then they, they give a footnote if you go to the website, which I, I've written down here, um, uh, you know, of a source to, to support that. And also, subsequently, Plato described astronomy and music as twinned studies of sensual recognition, astronomy for the eyes, music for the ears, and both requiring knowledge of numerical proportions. So, Plato is also uh, referenced in this uh, article in Wikipedia on music of the spheres because he looked at astronomy uh, and music as closely related. They're twinned studies. Um, and this, you know, comes very strongly from the Pythagorean tradition, which influenced Plato. So I wrote down here at the bottom of this slide, harmonic astrology could be viewed as Platonic astrology or Pythagorean astrology. So it's based on this search for a music of the spheres, uh, later developed by Kepler, and then even later developed by John Addy in the 1970s. Um, so that's just to give you a sense of, you know, what the history is behind what Kepler was doing and what Addy picked up on. Kepler didn't just all of a sudden say, hey, I'm, you know, this heavy scientist, let's get real man and be empirical. Um, he's really working from the Pythagorean uh, and Platonic tradition. So, um, just to, to make that clear. Um, so, classical astrologers, that is, astrologers who work mostly with ideas uh, prior to the modern astrology, going back to the 1600s and, and all the way back to the Hellenistic times in some cases, um, they sometimes give the impression that astrologers who use minor aspects have di diverted astrology from its ancient roots. However, the search for music of the spheres and a relationship between harmonics and astrology goes back to the earliest days of astrology, as we just saw on the previous slide uh, in the discussion of Pythagoras and Plato. And also in the Tetra Biblos, the four books, as they're now called, written by Ptolemy, which is a fundamental and important book in the history of astrology from the Hellenistic times. Here's a quote from, from the uh, Tetra Biblos. I give the, the source um, for it. it. You can get it on... Um, online at a website. This is the translation by Robin, by Frank Eggleston Robin. Okay, a quote from Ptolemy. He says, the explanation of opposition, he's talking about the opposition as aspect, okay? The explanation of opposition is immediately obvious because it causes the signs to meet on one straight line. But if we take the two fractions and the two super particulars, most important in music, and if the fractions one half and one third be applied to opposition composed of two right angles. The half makes the quartile and the third the sextile and the trine. Well, it's fairly abstract language. I don't want to get into all the technical details of it, but I wanted to just point out, I put in a, a yellow highlight here, most important in music. So Ptolemy, in explaining why aspects might work, refers to the harmonies related to music. So again we see the influence of this idea of the music of the spheres in, uh, in, a, in a, an astrologer from the Hellenistic times. So this music of the spheres idea is floating around all the way back to Pythagoras and Plato and having some influence on some astrologers in, in their understanding of astrology. Uh, okay, and, and by the way, uh, here I mentioned that in a footnote uh, by the translator Robin, he mentions that Nicomachus of Gerasa, um, so this fellow Nicomachus wrote this book, Introduction to Arithmetic, and he defines what super particular is. Uh, it's a number that contains within itself the whole blah, blah, blah. It's a, it's a, you can read what I wrote up there. It's um, very technical language, but the, the reason I've quoted it is because Robin, uh, the translator, who's an expert in these ancient languages, obviously, <clears throat> um, referred to Nicomachus uh, for the explanation of what the term that Ptolemy used, super particular, what it means. And Nicomachus um, was uh, roughly a contemporary of Ptolemy. Uh, Nicomachus was born in the year 60, roughly, and uh, Ptolemy was born about 30 years later. Uh, Nicomachus was an important mathematician in the ancient world. 
Best known for his works Introduction to Arithmetic and Manual of Harmonics, he was a Neo-Pythagorean who wrote about the mystical properties of numbers. So this is a quote from Wikipedia, and again you see the emphasis of the Pythagoreans, or in this case Neo-Pythagorean, because he's living, oh, some 500 years or more after Pythagoras, um, writing about the mystical properties of numbers. So this is part of this Pythagorean tradition. These numbers are mystical, they're born out of the mind of God, the manifest reality is created from them. So that's the perspective also that Kepler had much later in the year 1600, and then even later that um, John Addy had when he redeveloped it, and which I happen to have, um, and many other people in the Pythagorean tradition. Um, Okay, so, and and some modern mathematicians and so on are also uh, working in this tradition and, um, you know, f following in this lineage of thought. Okay, so, uh, you know, Pyth Pythagorean thought and Platonic thought is not dead. You'll see some uh, mathematicians uh, clearly w work in that frame of reference. Now, here's another example. John Frawley is a classical astrologer. He notes that uh, the astrologer William Lilly, um, William Lilly lived 1602 to 1681. He's a favorite of many classical astrologers. Um, Lilly uh, wrote, wrote a book that explains how he does horary astrology, and his rules are used by astrologers even today. Um, Frawley uses a lot of Lilly's rules. And uh, Louis is a major source for, for how to do uh, horary astrology. Excuse me, losing my voice here. Uh, horary astrology um, using these ancient rules. So, uh, now here's a quote from Frawley on the next slide where he pokes fun at modern astrologers. And he pokes fun at Lily because he says Lily uh, actually was a bit of a modernist. And he makes fun. He pokes some fun at minor aspects and asteroids. So he, you know, he's a, he's just a very witty and bright guy. And I want to read this to you because partly just because it's fun. So this is a lecture uh, John Frawley gave in 2009. So that's not so long ago. Just a few years ago, he brought, he uh, in his lecture he says, "I'll quote: Far from being the stern traditionalist of modern legend, Willie was in fact a gung ho modernist." The innovations that Ke Kepler was cooking up, the self-contradictory nonsense that is minor aspects, Lily was first in the queue. I'm quite sure if that, you'd go, that if you'd gone up to him and said, Hey, Bill, have you heard about Sedna? He'd have bitten your hand off. Wow, look, it's right on my Chiron. So he's, he's, if you don't know the language of astrology, you may miss part of the humor here, but this is uh, pretty hilarious stuff. Um... You know, Sedna and Chiron are, are obviously their asteroids that modern astrologers look, uh, that use, and um, and Lily was, in fact, influenced. Uh, he, he played around with the minor aspects that Kepler introduced. So Lily was not afraid or, or against modern innovations. Uh, many of the uh, classical astrologers today are against them. They're, they they might very much favor the ancient methods. So they are more traditional than Lily was. And you'll notice that um, uh, John Frawley refers to Kepler's introduction of minor aspects as the self-contradictory nonsense. So similar to uh, Robert Zoller, he doesn't see much value in what Kepler was doing, to put it mildly. It's nonsense. Um, now, it is ironic in a way that Frawley refers to Kepler's introduction of these uh, additional aspects as self-contradictory, because the underlying concept of in harmonics and, and using vibration or sound as a concept behind astrology um, is... is is an attempt actually to bring different ideas together. And I'll make a separate video about how the harmonic ideas are a basis for Arabic parts and, and other ideas. So rather than being self-contradictory, uh, the harmonic theory is an attempt to unify seemingly disparate astrological ideas. 
as we shall see, well, I don't know about the remainder of this presentation. Uh, that, it's actually in, in separate videos where I, I talk about how it does that. Okay. I got less ambitious in this video and made, made separated things out into separate videos. Okay. And also, you want to note that Pythagoras has been proven to be correct in modern times that uh, number, to a great extent, is the basis of the physical world. All matter is the same, except for the number of electrons and other atomic particles. All colors are the same, except for the length of the wave. Even seemingly different things like radio waves and light waves are actually identical, except for numbers. So isn't it amazing? I mean, uh, Pythagoras was right. Number, to, to, to a large extent, you know, is the basis of reality according to modern science. So I just wanted to point that out. Um, and perhaps there are unifying ideas in astrology, not just in physics. So in physics, there's a sense of a oneness and universal, universality which can actually be spiritually inspiring, even though uh, if you're an astrologer you may think of science as materialistic. The scientists are saying, you know, everything is one, everything is just different vibrations, uh, you know, of the same waves. Um, they've got all reality down to four forces and trying to, with super string theory, reduce it to one force. So there is a, a, like a mystical vision in, in a lot of science. And um, maybe the same could be done for astrology. And that's one of the ideas behind the music of the spheres. Uh, and harmonic astrology is a lot of different ideas are really based on vibration. Okay. So that's basically my presentation on the history of harmonic astrology, just to uh, sort out and straighten out some, some of those thoughts. And if you are an astrologer um, and you're interested in incorporating harmonics into what you do, uh, the harmonic chart is, is one of the tools to work with. It's one of the really important ones. There, there are others, but you can start if you're interested in using the harmonic chart. I have a separate video, Introduction to Harmonic Astrology. <clears throat> and you may choose to integrate ideas from harmonic astrology, or not. Uh, and if you do integrate them, you may choose to use the ideas in harmonic astrology that are consistent with theory. So, for example, here I'm in Sirius 1.3, and I'm looking at the chart of a famous person, Hank Aaron. He's a, uh, he was a baseball player. Um, and if I want to look at the harmonic charts in Sirius or Kepler, then you can do this in, in any astrology software. They all have harmonic charts, I think. Uh, you select harmonic chart, and I'll do the 5th, 7th, and ninth. I just separate them with commas, and I can do those all at once. And now I have a 5th harmonic chart, and I can interpret it. Um, so there it is, and you can say, okay, Sun's in Leo, it's in the 12th house. But should you do the same kinds of things in a harmonic chart that you do um, in a natal chart? Well, if you want to find harm, if you want to follow harmonic theory, there are certain things you would do differently. So, for example, if I right-click on this to go to the settings, and then I go to customize, and I select the aspects to customize, you would should use harmonic orbs like the medium uh, size harmonic orbs, or you might use the, the large orbs. Um, now my aspect lines are based on using the orbs that you pretty much have to use. I mean, you really do have to use these orbs. You can use the small, medium, or large, but that's basically your only choice. You can't just make up any orbs, because then you don't follow wave theory. So. I just wanted to mention that, um, that in terms of practical application, if you listen to this video and you say, gee, you know, this harmonic astrology sounds interesting, I like music of the spheres, uh, what do I do? Well, you can do harmonic charts um, in Kepler and Sirius, if I right click, this particular chart here, um, letter K, uh, big large inner area. This makes a large inner area, um, and it already has the harmonic orb selected, and you can see the patterns. And basically, you look at the aspects and and you interpret them. So there's Mercury and Pluto are conjunct, square Jupiter, and um, 
you know, the, you interpret it in, in terms of the fifth harmonic. And what does the fifth harmonic mean? Well, you can watch the other video on Introduction to Harmonic Astrology. Also at our website, website for the software company that I that I work for, astrosoftware.com, if you go to this website, I'm here in a browser, and if you go to Information on the menu bar at the top, and then Articles on the left, you will see all these articles, and here's a, a lot of articles I wrote, and you can go down to, uh, it's down here somewhere, number 39, free online book, and you can click on this, and this is an, one good resource uh, where I go through the meanings of the harmonics, uh, so it opens up this entire book of research, and at the beginning of the book I also review what other astrologers say about the meanings of the harmonics. Okay, so so that's another resource. Okay, so in this uh, video we're making right now, my point is that harmonic astrology has roots in this idea of music of the spheres. It's an ancient idea. It's been developing, and, and I'm giving you some idea of how you can learn more about it and use it in your... Uh, astrological practice if you have an astrological practice or you're a student of astrology and you want to learn more about it. Okay, so that's it. Um, the concluding points. Number, I've got three concluding points and I'm uh, for this video and we're done. Um, one is the concept of a music of the spheres affected the thinking of Pythagoras, Plato, Ptolemy, Kepler, and the harmonic astrology developed by John Addy. Uh, Addy developed those ideas, or published a lot of his ideas on that in the 1970s. So it's based on this idea of a music of the spheres. It's an ancient idea. Uh, Pythagoras, by the way, lived about 570 B.C. to 495 B.C. Plato, a little bit later, around 428 to 348 B.C. Uh, so they lived just preceding the flowering of Hellenistic astrology. And so those ideas filtered on through the time when Hellenistic astrology was was developed and flowering. Uh, you see how it affected Ptolemy and, and some of the astrologers in, in that time period. It probably wasn't the major influence, but it was an influence on some of the astrologers that, uh, at that time. It seems like music of the spheres and harmonics has been a kind of minority approach throughout the history. It's a minority approach today, it was a minority approach in Hellenistic times, uh, as far as we can tell. So, um, you know, it hasn't been the majority movement then or now, but it's managed to continue, uh, limp along, you might say. Um, you know, and people like Kepler and Addy um, sort of revived it, and then and then it sort of fades into the background again. Uh, I, I, you know, use harmonic astrology as a strong foundation for what I do, I'm probably in the minority there. So so that's how that sort of lineage has continued th uh, through the centuries. Point number two, uh, well, I've already made it. <clears throat> Kepler's ideas and Addy's ideas continue this ancient idea of a harmony of the spheres. Uh, and the people who embrace these ideas, like Kepler and Addy, uh, myself and other astrologers, tend, uh, most of them seem to feel that... Um, that this number behind reality is empirical, it, it is measurable, and there's a mystical, awe-inspiring quality to it as well. And lastly, um, if you're an astrologer or a student of astrology, you may avoid harmonic astrology. You may say, you know, it's not for me. I have a system that I like. I'm in a different tradition and lineage. That's one possibility. You might take some ideas from harmonic astrology and incorporate it into what you do. And then thirdly, you might incorporate ideas from harmonic astrology in a way that is consistent with harmonic ast astrological theory, such as using the orbs that you're required to use according to wave theory. <clears throat> um, you know, so you have sort of three levels of, of what will you do if you're interested in astrology or involved in astrology in regards to harmonic astrology. A, leave it out, it's not for me. <clears throat> B, take some ideas but take them and incorporate them into the way that you think and work in astrology and the the model that you use for astrology, the paradigm. Um, or take the harmonic astrology on its own terms with all of the 
foundational ideas of waves and sound and vibration and what that implies uh, theoretically and, and apply that and see if it works. Okay, so there you go. Some of the history background uh, of harmonic astrology. I wanted to set the record straight about some of the history of astrology. It's gotten very confusing with different ideas. And I think that um, Robert Zoller and, and uh, John Frawley, I think, if they are to watch this video, I think they're going to agree with me. You know, I may have taken some of the things they said out of context, maybe not, or at least, um, you know, some of my students and colleagues have, have interpreted what they said in a certain way. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that they would agree with it because the history is pretty clear. And so I just wanted to clarify those points. Okay, thank you very much. Take care. God bless. Namaste.